the the main players. live streaming is on. Sorry, Nelly. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I, I was just saying I don't know the philosophy nor the nor the uh, major players, so I, I'm just gonna listen, listen in. Okay, so um, maybe um, I mean we can we can discuss maybe some. Mm, basic principles from Epictetus and Rufus, but perhaps something we went back on um, again when rereading or, or reading for the first time some of the works and just observing maybe um, something we never noticed before. Um, actually, I did want to maybe mention something about um, uh, Rufus. Um, so so for those who, those who are interested who don't know, Gaius Masonius Rufus was a Roman Stoic who taught Epictetus, this the, probably the more famous um, Roman Stoic. And um, in the series of lectures on Rufus, there's actually two. I was So ev everybody talks about how Rufus is the one Stoic who talked about egalitarianism in Stoicism, the common education of, of women and men in, in, in philosophy. And um, um, for the time, this was, you know, breathtaking worldview. Um, but um, there were... I was surprised to see there was more content about it. I thought there would just be a phrase here and there or a paragraph here and there, but there were two lectures actually just solely about women and in, in, in philosophy. One was called um, that woman too should study philosophy and answering the question, should daughters receive the same training as sons? Um, I was, I, I don't think it's perfect. Um, I, and I didn't think it was going to be perfect um, that um, he, I mean, he, he does go on to say that um, there's absolutely no reason why women shouldn't be taught and educated in philosophy as men. It was, I guess it was a common educational theme to be tutored in philosophy um, as opposed to other subjects back then. Um, but um, he, he does say some things that are a little bit awkward. Um, for example, um, uh, oh, I don't have a written, I don't have a copy it down, but it's in lecture three. And while he does say that philosophy would benefit both women, men and women to become virtuous, become courageous, self-disciplined, temperate, why, um, uh, just, and he goes through those four virtues. He kind of does say that the whole purpose of using those virtues is is in your job, in your role in life. And then he goes on to say how, you know, um, the woman's role is, is, is usually to keep care of the house, to, to do this and that. Um, and so I think he can't escape the fact that during his day, there was kind of this um, conservatism towards women in the labor market. They should only be doing this. But, um, uh, and he does say he wouldn't contradict that. He wouldn't um, uh, oppose that standard. Um, but I, I was surprised at the fact that he, there was a lot of lecture notes on women in philosophy. Um, actually a bunch more, like there was another lecture on kings in philosophy and two on women in philosophy. Um, so he, he talked a lot about like roles, uh, people who have certain roles in society and how they should respond to philosophy And that, that trickles down into Epictetus. Um, that Epictetus talks about, you know, um, owning your role in owning your, owning your role in society. Um, that you should, um, uh, I guess, what's the better word for it? Um, be virtuous in your own role in society. Um, and I think that comes from Rufus. He talks a lot, he doesn't specifically say role, but each of his lectures, a lot of his lectures are specifically about one type of person in society. Yeah, I, I see a lot of people uh, that oftentimes criticize the Stoics because they are like, they are endorsing slavery or they're endorsing you know, the role of man over the role of the woman. And I feel it is a little bit far-fetched to reach those conclusions. We have to understand that it, it was a different civilization and that 
uh, today, for example, is basically uh, an information age. We work with information and data. Back in the days, it's not like like uh, the employments for men and women were, you know, from home using a laptop or at a cubicle and at, a, at an office. Uh, we don't know. We don't even know. I can only speculate what what will happen of our civilizations if women didn't have more for more of a nurturing role in the families and men more of a maybe war or other types of roles, right? So I think speaking about equality in, among genders back then, it's uh, it's easy to criticize it from today's standpoint, but it's probably much more difficult to implement back then. So in that sense, um, uh, again, I think Epictetus didn't have much of a choice when it came to his role in society, thinking about him being a slave. Uh, and I do see how many people will object uh, his comments about embracing your role in society today. Uh, but I think everything has to be examined, you know, within the context in which they were and which we are today. So I wonder how they define their virtue, because I can understand how the Christians view it. It's pretty much spelled out for you, but. Actually, now you bring up a good point. I actually wanted to ask, ask this um, because in, in one of Rufus's um, lectures, and there are various ways we've, we've gone over before how, we, how the Stoics and how in interpretations today define the virtues. But the one virtue they mentioned, they gave a translation for the word courage in Greek. And, and Giannis, I don't know if this is this 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 is the same kind of English translation of the modern word in Greek. But in one of the footnotes in one of the lectures for Rufus, it says that the ancient Greek word for courage actually meant manliness, and that it was only later translated as courage. I'm not sure if that's the same in modern Greek. Does it say which word it is? Uh, uh, yeah, let me copy. Let me copy and paste it. Yeah. 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 Uh, lecture four. Okay. And Andrea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably it's Andrea, which uh, it it comes from the the same root as as man. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Indeed, indeed, and oh. and it is it. Yeah, indeed. I never thought of it, but you're right. And it's still used in modern Greek. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the word they have. It's not accurate because there's a typo in the middle. I, I, there's not supposed to be a five, I'm pretty sure. But this was the, um, the is it, oh, that's another one. That's another one. But okay. what? Oh. Yeah. Sorry, is it C L Y? That's what they. I'll, 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 I'll copy and paste the entire thing. I'm not sure if they do a good job of transcribing the entire <laughs> passage. But this is the footnote. Um, I think it's a problem using the English letters. I don't know what happened with the. I cannot read it. I don't understand what it says. Yeah, but but I thought I thought uh, uh, I I thought it would be another word. Anyway, mm -hmm. and I think um, there's another note, and it's not. I don't think it's that same. Uh, uh, yeah, he, mm. he, it says also in this footnote, if you read, apparently, Musonius' attempt to justify its appropriate application to women is not mere rhetoric. So I think what they're saying is that um, what's interesting, because the original Greek, it pretty much meant manliness, this word for courage, um, that um, uh, that it, what this footnote is saying, I think, that Musonius felt compelled to kind of argue why courage was also something to be adopted and, and trained for by women because it's not it was like for us it's evident oh everybody could have courage back then if they thought of courage as manliness well then rufus would have to make strains to kind of argue that it was for women as well so i thought that, that i thought that kind of put a reason behind why he was spending so much time on this from a linguistic standpoint okay but I um uh, I, I do I do uh, see the lectures here on the, the lecture four uh, saying so daughters receive the same training as son, sons. Um, 
and and it says, is this the, the I think it is the one, ah, now I, I realize it is the same, the same footnote that you copied. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, in general, it's, it's astonishing uh, text um, bringing the, f f given the time, um, presenting some arguments why, why men and women wouldn't be so different. So it's uh, I did I didn't know about this before. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're saying this word on Andrea is the <laughs> word used usually used for courage. Yeah, I believe I believe that's the the word um, that they're trying to to show here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because and Andras is uh, the man, so that's probably. Probably the, the 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 reason why it's connected to to ma, to man. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, it's um. Yeah, it's. I, I agree that it's like it's you know um, surprising how egalitarian he tried to advocate mm. for education. Of women, and women, but it, it, it is I, I, again. I guess we a sign of the times that his whole argument. So um, in lectures three and four, for why um, women should be just as educated as men is not purely out of like I think today we take this this equality between men and women to be more an assumption. We just take it for granted that, that that's what should be because that's what it that's what it's right is that they should be given the same opportunities to be educated equally. Whereas with Ms. Sonia's roof is, he kind of started from a standpoint that um, uh, women um, required virtue and the knowledge of philosophy to, um, to, commit, um, to, com to commit to the work they're doing in society. So he, he kind of used he, I think he used a combination of the some biological argument that women and men are not so different biologically, and um, uh, but also a role in society argument that women needed to um, tend to the house, tend to the slaves in the house, and and do and do this to kind of so they need philosophy in order to to, to, to go through those hardships and um, uh, to go through that work um, virtuously. Um, so it's uh, it's in, it's um, it's interesting. He took those pains to just get to that conclusion. I wonder what came first for him. You know, I see these arguments by philosophers back then, but I wonder if he originally just had the idea: why not women be educated just as men? And then only after the fact he created the argument, or if he created the argument first and then came to the conclusion. Because it doesn't, the argument doesn't seem straightforward to me, at least for, you know, I don't know, at least for me, um, I, I wouldn't have guessed to start from where he started. But it, sometimes it could be lack of practice, right? This is what you're saying. And maybe with uh, practice, uh, for example, when it comes to bravery with practice, uh, women can uh, be at the same level, right? Or with uh, the virtues, then it's just a matter of training and education again. Yeah, he never says, yeah, I think he would agree with that because he never says that they can't reach the same, um, the same uh, level of being stoic, being virtuous, like he—he uh, he says that they all have the same capacity to do so. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all right. He obviously didn't take um, childbirth into account. Yeah, <laughs> um, which is one of the rare things I've ever seen in my life. Um, so it's, I don't think it's about women being as equally as courageous and brave as men. I think. Um, it's obviously an individual um, thing between you know men and women, but why would women want to be equal with men anyway? You know, I mean, 
we're all naturally equals, and that should be just an assumption. Could you repeat the last part? Your bike goes in and out sometimes and hear the last few words. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, obviously nowadays we assume. It's just an assumption that men and women are equal. Um, and for such a learned men who, you know, a good few thousand years of philosophy behind them at that point, it surprises me that that wasn't the conclusion that they naturally came to anyway within society within Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a um, that's a good point. And this, the Stoics kind of it, it, actually Greek philosophers in general are really good at coming to to truths or to to kind of vague ideas about how to live good in society without the technology and the and the logic the logical knowledge we have today um, about how to make arguments and come to conclusions rationally. But they seemed to to, um, to kind of build those foundations that we use today. And yet they couldn't come, as you're right, they couldn't come to that conclusion that, um, but yeah, I think it's it's more of a product of tradition and custom. I think this is why, I think I, I, I think you guys both know, but um, for Nelly, um, Seneca, um, uh, the Roman um, politician under Nero and Roman Stoic um, talked about how he tried to become vegetarian and, um, the only reason why he, he went back to eating meat was because his father would disown him, basically, if he didn't stop being vegetarian because he didn't want his son to be associated with those with that class of people in society. So I think it's um, I think it's the same thing with women and men. This this the egalitarianism that um, the most most philosophers perhaps had a had a hint that it was um, a valid assumption to make, but that just like vegetarianism for Seneca, they kind of backed out of that argument because it wasn't popular in the day. Maybe <laughs> maybe for them it was just more um, more suited to fit with the times. And the, I think that's one major distinction between the Stoics and the likes of the Cynics. I think the cynics wouldn't have been bothered what the prevailing culture said or demanded. You know, Diogenes wouldn't have cared. He would have just said, said that's how, we, how it is. And I think the Stoics obviously cared more about what was happening in the prevailing culture if that was their consideration with the Gast agenda. Yeah, out of all the Hellenistic philosophies, I think the, I think the Stoics were the most participatory in society. I th yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was fun reading Rufus. I think I'm going to, there's, I only read his lectures, but there are apparently fragments, what they call fragments as well. I have, still have to read, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, I wanted to turn to Epictetus because I don't want to spend the entire time talking about Rufus. And I know we, we probably, at least, at least some of us have read Epictetus. Um, it would be good to kind of maybe review reading him again if we had um and if we did um any thoughts about any new translations you've or not new in terms of um just came out in the last few years but um a different translation that you might have read when you reread him something i will admit though i never um I know I still haven't read. So when I reread Epictetus the other day, I was only reading his handbook or Enchiridion. And I didn't, I still, and uh, this is only my fault, I haven't read his discourses. Um, apparently his discourses are longer. Apparently his Enchiridion is only like, yeah, it's, it's just this compared to the discourses, which is this. And the Enchiridion comes from his discourses. And a lot of times I see passages from Epictetus's um, discourses that I know boil down to something I've read in the Enchiridion. Um, but it's, um, I still have to read his discourses because I think there's more to Epictetus in there than what I've already read in the, in the simple Enchiridion. Um, but um, I think this, this focus on the mind over the body for Epictetus, um, now to put Alvaro's comment into context, definitely makes sense for Epictetus because most of the famous phrases we have from Epictetus are all about opinions and how we deal with opinions, judgments, and impressions. 
So now it makes, I think reading Rufus and that comment by Alvaro kind of makes more contextual sense for me why Epictetus wrote the way he did and why he chose to focus on the things that he did. Yeah, I think if you compare him to like Seneca, you know, Seneca tried his best to um, you know, sleep on wooden floors and to feel hardships. Um, obviously, he's a very wealthy man, very high in society. Epictetus was the entire opposite, and hardships were just natural to him. It was just part of his DNA, part of his daily life. So I think that set him apart from the other Stoics, even from like some Marcus Aurelius as well. I think he's quite a unique character, Epictetus, basically due to his his, um, his life experience early on in his life. Yeah. One thing I will say about Epic Epictetus um, that he he seems to agree with um, with the cynics that. Uh, you should you should live through society with no shame. Um, that he has kind of I think this is perhaps why he doesn't discuss the body too often and kind of going through hardships. He discusses hardships in the sense of going through them emotionally, but he never discusses them and how they affect his externals, how they affect his body. Whereas Rufus is very very specific about um, the, the, even the tactics you can use to, um, to train yourself and the body. I mean, Rufus, I think, founded some of the ways in which Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius eventually used to train the body. He says, we use the training common to both when we discipline ourselves to cold, heat, thirst, hunger. Alvaro was talking about fasting before. Um, meager rations, hard beds, so you said sleeping on the floor, avoidance of pleasures, and patience under suffering. So the, it's, it's interesting, all the discomforts that, um, that Rufus discusses, he always relates to the body first and then discusses how, they're, how they affect the mind. But it's interesting that um, Epictetus kind of this skips the whole part about the body and just discusses how hardships um, and, and shamelessness can train the mind. Um, so I, I, I found this, uh, this uh, chapter in uh, <clears throat> Epictetus, the Enchiridion, that uh, talks about the body. <clears throat> and I found the, trans the English translation on the internet. I don't know if it's the best one, but, um, but it, it, it talks about, about putting your body in a hardship situation um to make it uh to train uh your actually to put it in a very hard situation not even drinking water or whatever um uh, but then don't don't talk about it that i think that's what it, he tries to say here um <laughs> yeah i really like that quote at the very end but when very thirsty, draw in cold water and spit it out and say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really hard uh, exercise or <laughs> not even drinking water. Um... But but in general, I think it's the first part. Uh, it's to 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 leave. Um, Frugally, I don't know the English word. Frugally, to be honest. Um, yeah, um, to live. Uh, uh, to do you understand but, it though? Yeah, I see. The, yeah, I understand. I I I see that. The, hopefully, it corresponds to the Greek uh, text I have here. And so, yeah. So this goes for for the body and the and the mind, I guess. So. Um, so he, he he talks in this play. in this case he talks about the, the body hmm. yeah uh, but, but it, um, not not in a in a sense of physical exercise but in terms of uh, hard, hardship or uh, uh, a challenge to put the body in a challenge or something yeah he's not um yeah this doesn't seem like something that you you do it's something that you 
you don't do. Like the, <laughs> right. instead of instead of going through hard instead of uh, doing a discomfort, like um, mm -hmm. going through strenuous exercise or mm -hmm. sitting in a hard bed, is that you you don't drink water to feel like what it is to to or to build up your resilience to go through um, thirst or hunger. But probably other 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 Stoics were also saying uh, um, like um, try to sleep on the floor and not in a comfort bed or something like that to 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 put your yourself in this situation um, of not feeling very comfortable, um, right? Yeah, I think Seneca is the one that really stands out for that because obviously Seneca was very wealthy. I don't think he felt guilty about his wealth, but he certainly um, sought out discomfort actively. Whereas for Epictetus, it was just a natural part of his day-to-day -day life, certainly in his early life anyway. There's major differences between the two. I'm sorry, are you reading from uh, from one of the links in the, in the meetup? <laughs> Uh, yeah, but, um, uh, yeah, but I copied the text in uh, in the comments on the chat. Can you see the chat? Yeah, yeah, in... I saw. It's not like you, you all three are reading the same text or anything. You, you. Uh, no, uh, okay, I co okay. right. I just uh, found a, a quick uh, link on the internet okay. um, where it has a translation in English. Uh, that, but I don't know if there are better ones. But, but what's the reason for all these uh, these uh, these uh, intentional uh, hardships? It's a, yeah, um, and I probably did, don't have the last word on this. Perhaps perhaps Tony or Giannis has another answer because there's multiple reasons. But I mean, the one the one reason is that um, so the the four Stoic virtues are um, wisdom, which is probably better translated as um, prudence, um, being cautious, or being able to tell right from wrong. Um, then there's courage. Then there's temperance. Temperance, which is otherwise translated as self-discipline or self-control. And lastly, there's just uh, or justice, which is basically the ethical virtue. It's um, how to um, uh, how to treat others fairly um, and how to kind of cooperate and live in society or um, and, and so forth. So there's four virtues. And so it was, it was the two philosophers we're mainly talking about. It was Rufus and Epictetus who kind of founded, um, as Seneca did as well, but it was Rufus who kind of put it on, um, put it in this firm founding, firm foundation that he said, you actually have to go out of your way to um, practice what they what we call discomforts, these little hardships, to help you build um, to build resilience through life, endurance, so, example, to endurance exactly. So um, uh, if um, uh, it's it's not to it's not to uh, eradicate emotions against anything. It's simply to it's simply to help yourself understand that in Epictetus's words, roughly. Um, there's a difference between things that happen to you and your understanding of things. So um, when you go through hardships, you train your mind to understand that what you're going through um, is not really a hardship. It's, um, uh, um, it's only in your mind that it's something that's hard. Um, but in reality, it's something that you can endure. Um, and the fact that you can endure it means that um, uh, it's not as bad as you originally thought. It's not what the Stoics say is an evil. Um, and Rufus says that often. You, you think these hardships are evils, but they're not. So the whole point of the, these hardships, and they could be as small as like um, sleeping on the floor or even taking the stairs when you're not taking the elevator. Like it's as, it can be as small as those where you're kind of just preparing your body and mind to do things the difficult way. So when those times come, you can deal with them more easily. But I'm, I, uh, if Giannis and, and Tony would like to, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, that's that's obviously the the, the reason. But but uh, another dimension, maybe in sometimes you you uh, try to deprive yourself from uh, things uh, because sometimes we uh, take them as given and we don't appreciate them. And and then 
and then you know when you uh, take it out intentionally uh, then you you understand that this was uh, something you should have been thankful <laughs> like uh, like a nice bed to to sleep it's something that you can uh, lose any time in your life and then um, you should never take it for given right um, and so you you exercise yourself by by uh, doing it on purpose so that you can go back and uh, appreciate what you have. You, 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 you all of you agree on this? Like you think it, it, it's necessary to, or, or you think, uh, I mean, I, I, after hearing this, I would rather feel, you know, I, I know how to appreciate without having to go through, no? That would be a better way. I mean, just personally, uh, I I appreciate. I, I would say, I mean, if I if I know how to appreciate my bed without having to sleep on the hard floor, I mean, wouldn't that be enough, or or that's not enough? I think it's enough for you, Nelly. If that works for you, I think it's whatever works on an individual basis. I don't sleep on a hard floor. <laughs> Me neither. Um, that's, I'm just being honest. I, I get all the hardships I ever need from my wife in life. Um, I don't really. But, um, but yeah, I think it's on an individual basis. I, I agree with Steve. It could be as, something as simple as just jumping up the stairs or walking to the store instead of taking the car. You know, I think it, it just keeps us in touch with reality in a world which is now designed to sort of um, take you away from that reality in whichever way possible. I think it's it's a good grounding, and it's certainly a technique that I use with my son also. Um, so it does have value to it, but my personal opinion is it, it it's all down to the individual. Mm -hmm. If you don't need to sleep on a hard floor, Nelly, then don't. Have those <laughs> okay. lovely, comfortable pillows. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, also, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say as well, obviously, about three or four hundred years prior to these guys, the Epicureans um, were about. And the Epicureans viewed pleasure as being um, something to attain, um, something to um, want in your life on a continual basis. So was Stoicism ever a sort of slant against Epicureanism in some way as well with regards to pleasures? I've never really studied that before, but... Um, seems to be maybe some some form of link i don't know so um yeah the um actually i don't think you were you were attending our meetings at the time tony but when we did a, a discussion on epicureanism it's um it, we, we initially thought it was more of an attainment of pleasures but really the epicureans were more about reducing pain and hardships actually the epicureans philosophy is basically founded on the idea that you should avoid um, these kinds of hardships, specifically because um, they um, they uh, um, it's contrary to the Stoics, which think um, the little by little these help you kind of inoculate yourself against um, uh, feeling negatively um, in reaction to things. The Epicureans thought that by avoiding these, um, you already do that. Um, so they thought to retreat to your garden and uh, don't participate in society. Um, that's an extreme example for the ancient ones, but any Epicurean today, I think there's a couple of groups out there actually that that still think that you should avoid these little hardships. Um, I, I was actually, so I, I come back around, I was actually trying to comment to what you were saying before. And yeah, it's, um, so the, the Stoics would never say that there's a common, like if let's say there's a, let's say somebody pops up with a school of Stoicism today. Um, I mean, schools, so to speak, ask for a common curriculum everybody passes through, but Stoicism is um, is a philosophy that tries to appeal to everybody's circumstances. So it's what I what I actually actually um, found a good phrase to use from one of the books I'm reading. It's more of a schematic philosophy, so it gives you kind of a scheme by which to follow, but it doesn't give you um, tips in every little situation you're in. So um, just because it helps you understand that these hardships could help 
help you appreciate things more or deal with hardships more doesn't mean that in your own particular context that that's necessary or that's useful. Um, the Stoics understood that. Um, I, I'm a little bit more on the side of Epictetus and Rufus more generally. I, I kind of, at least for myself, feel that at part these little discomforts help me, um, as you said, Giannis, to appreciate things more, but also to, um, uh, to help myself endure these hardships later. I like thinking about Zeno's um, Zeno, who's the founder of Stoicism, uh, Zeno's, um, Zeno once had a lecture, um, this a story by another person was telling about Zeno, where he, somebody asked him what, what understanding is or, or what knowledge is. I forget which of the words they used, but he, um, he took his hand and he had an open fist. And then he said, this is what, um, uh, this is what seeing is. This is what, um, uh, um, discuss, discussion is, this is what uh, understanding is, and this is what knowledge is. And so the idea for him and for the Stoics was also that um, you can never really be sure you actually know something until you go through it. So I, again, completely up to your context. But for me, my idea for going through these little hardships is that um, and I do like going through some of them, taking cold showers or taking the stairs when I don't have to, um, that um, um, I don't know if I really do appreciate things. Like um, just because you say you do, or you think you do for me anyway, how can I ever be sure? And how can you ever have enough appreciation? Um, or um, how can you ever know you'll be ready for the next hardship or for the next pandemic? Um, um, not in any way condoning this pandemic is a good thing for humanity or a good lesson, right? That not at all what I'm saying, and the Stoics didn't say that, but they're talking about these little hardships. So do you do it in practice? Um, I, I take cold showers. I'm beginning to take them more and more. Um, I, um, I actually have, so I don't sleep on the floor, <laughs> but I have a, um, a really thin uh, futon that's... Um, well, I'll let my girlfriend tell you how she never wants to sleep in that thing. Um, so it's, uh, it's, <laughs> I like it. And actually I've gotten so used to it that I, I actually prefer it over her bed. <laughs> I, it's, I actually have a hard time sleeping in very, very comfortable Soft, beds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe, so maybe there's kind of a disadvantage there, you know, you get used to the heart, <laughs> but um, yeah. But then that, that, I guess that proves it's my context, right? I prefer that bed versus the bed you like, but you may, your body may prefer that bed. So it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this, but, but cold showers is a little bit harder. Um, hmm. you, ha you have to begin. Um, <laughs> actually, I didn't get that from the Stoics. One of my friends um, started getting me into that. And he said the best way to deal with cold showers is, don't go cold right at the beginning. Don't, mm. you might put your body in shock if you just yeah, start yeah. showering and freezing cold water the first couple of days. So kind of slowly get it, slowly build up the, how, how cold the, the temperature is over time. And but um, yeah. Yeah, um, it's, um, I don't think I can think of a, uh, like the Stoics, the Stoics, I think, were the only Hellenistic philosophy that thought these hardships help you achieve virtue. Um, the, cynics, the cynics are the only ones, I think, but the cynics didn't think that practicing these, these, these hardships are good to achieve virtue. They thought literally living in them were. You know, like the cynics thought that you should live on the street with a robe and nothing else because that's all you really need. So I think, it, I think they're different because they didn't think that hardships were something to practice. They thought hardships were something to live. Um, and the Stoics were a bit more moderate in that, in that extent. Again, there seems to be some similarities between um, Christianity. Yeah, yeah. I'm having the Stoics and the folks. Yeah, exactly. You know, and there's a quote from the Bible, you know, foxes have holes and the birds of the air has, have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. You know, so there's this idea of, you know, 
almost a semi-glorification of hardship. Um, I'm not saying that, that sort of Epictetus glorifies hardship in any way, but certainly seems to be, to be some similarities between the, the Stoic doctrine and um, Christianity. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and I wish we had found this out a, a, a maybe a, the last month when we had that discussion about Christianity and Stoicism. And there is this historical trend that you see some Stoic texts being used and adapted into Christian text and, and theology. Um, but that, that is interesting that there's, there's little Christian theologians have said about this particular part of Stoicism. Like they take a lot of the, they take some of the theology and they take some of the ethics, but I don't hear them specifically talk about taking these discomforts as something to use, but you are right. Like, especially in, um, in and I'm, I'm no historian, but the the stereotype of medieval Christian sex um, using, um, uh, what's a, uh, um, where they, they, um, they might hurt themselves in order to, you know, um, uh, what's the word, um, sin, well, you know, in order to kind of um, um, forgive themselves of sin or to cleanse themselves. Um, Self-flagellation, I think. Yeah, thank you. There, yeah. Um, hmm. yeah. Yeah, but the, the, um, that, that's one thing. But the other thing is, uh, I think in Christianity, you have the concept of, <clears throat> um, uh, some uh, uh, saints, I don't know, who were really living in extreme conditions, like in a cave or whatever, without any li very little food or eating, um, uh, you know, uh, bugs uh, <laughs> around them, and uh, really trying to take away all of the comfort, for the physical comfort. In, and, and I think the idea is that this allows your spirit to allows you to, to focus on your spiritual world and to make the spiritual world flourish and and really focus spiritually on what matters and not on 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 anything around you on anything physical so that you can detach from the physical world as much as possible and focus on the spiritual world and make these flurries, right? So that was maybe the extreme case of it. You do make a good point though, that there's a there's maybe a, um, a connection where this element of Epictetus' writing of, of disregarding the body is important, that the Christians might've taken that logical, that logic to the extreme and said, well, if the body doesn't matter, then you can harm it, and because it's all for for so and such, and yeah, that's you make a good point that that kind of um, element in this in Epictetus is maybe um, hmm. flare with flare with the flare with the extreme body is an important may actually have more extreme logical conclusions. So is this philosophy uh, more more in in how we grow spiritually or or how we become like just wiser? I mean, gain how I mean, which way is it? it is this, this? Yeah, we keep. I think I I don't know if we're confusing you because we keep mentioning Christianity. The only reason we keep mentioning Christianity is because we had a discussion about a month ago and there's um, this, there's no philosophical connection, very little philosophical connection. The um, Christianity is a religion, Stoicism is a philosophy. And the only reason we keep bringing it up is because Christian, there's, there's evidence that Christian theologians took Stoic phrases and ph philosophical elements and adapted it into their religion. That that we're just we just had some passing thoughts and compared. Oh, okay. But um, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, so that was just kind of comparative philosophy or comparative but, philosophy to religion. So, um, so in a way, so because for me, I, I really don't think you know hardship makes us wiser. 
that's just my personal opinion. Uh, I think uh, if I want to become wiser, I need to be with wiser people. I mean, I, 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 I'm a firm believer in uh, gaining energy from people with stronger energy. Um, I don't see myself, you know, uh, perhaps experiencing uh, homelessness will, 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 will uh, make me gain uh, wisdom. But I do see myself perhaps uh, reading great works of others uh helps me so uh, that's why i ask you uh, about this uh the reason for these hardship i mean if it's a if there's a spiritual reason that's a different thing because i'm i'm not religious nor am i a spiritual but i do want to be you know i don't know if virtuous is the right word but you know in general wiser uh, well um better. yeah 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 um I put it in the comments, um, Marcus Aurelius's meditations, just, uh, I would, I would recommend that for you because okay. the first book, the first book of his, um, it's a book, but it's really a chapter, but the first book of his meditations, which is basically a self journal that came out public decades and centuries later, um, they're just passages of him giving thanks to the people and friends around him and for the qualities in them that he valued. It's a very stoic thing. Like also something about stoicism, you don't have to take it as a whole. You don't have to take the philosophy and live every element. You don't have to live every hardship and believe in every theological element of stoicism. Part of stoicism is also what Marcus Aurelius did. And he was um, actually the whole first chapter of his meditations is just his listing qualities about his friends and family that he admired and that he want to take he wants to take with them so and he also recommends that to um to be by those friends who you think you, you deem have good character so hmm. the i think stoicism is um generally a philosophy but especially today it's so influential because there's so many elements and tactics Stoic philosophers used over the centuries that you can just take one of them and, and just starting applying it in your life. In your life. Thank you. Um, actually, I wanted to mention something. You, um, uh, um, j just as a note, virtue for the Stoics, for the um, for the Greeks, actually. Um, literally translates to excellence of character so it, uh, or, or excellence. So it has very little meaning compared to what we think of virtue today. Um, virtue for them meant being of excellent character. That's all it meant. So um, you don't have to take it as a, as a righteous thing. Um, yeah, I think it's, but lesson learned for us, maybe, um, uh, maybe when we know we have new members coming on, we don't talk so much about um, uh, relationships with Christianity or religion if we have, if we don't have to, because perhaps people get the wrong idea. <laughs> I think when Tony mentioned the self, the self um, um, flagellation that uh, uh, um, uh, that it uh, might be off-putting to some people. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I think with regards to wisdom, though, as well, I think the Stokes are quite clear that experience imbues wisdom also. You know, as Seneca quotes that um, no man was wise by chance. I think it's because you experience things too, and you have to experience things in order to really taste um, the result of that, which usually is wisdom in some way, shape or form. Um, particularly if we learn by our mistakes. I think if someone just talks about being wise, um, then it's more difficult to sort of become a wise person just by sort of um, osmosis, if you like. Um, I don't think there's any substitute for experience and experience and hardships, even if you don't deserve to experience them, if they just happen to you. But when you come out the other side and you feel that wisdom, I think that's, and the wisdom is better than something that's just read.
Uh, actually, I was just, it's fantastic that you mentioned that. I, it makes me think of a quote by, um, in one of Rufus's um, lectures, um, and I'm trying to find it. I think this is it right here. Uh, yeah, it's lecture five, and it's literally titled, which is more effective, theory or practice? So <laughs> he actually tries to answer this question, and then he he actually has a good, he has a good line emphasizing what you just said. Um, yeah, actually, it's the, it's the concluding line. He says that theory which teaches how one should act is related to application, in the um, posted it in the chat. Theory which teaches how one should act is related to application and comes first, since it's not possible to do anything really well unless its practical execution is in harmony with theory. And he says, in effectiveness, however, practice takes precedence over theory as being more influential in leading men to action. So yeah, I think that's exactly what Tony was saying. That it's a um, very good point that Rufus also mentions that. Um, Something I think Epictetus also, he, he seems to um, unbalance in, in, in his discourses and um, takes, press, takes preference over practice rather than theory. But Rufus tries to explain that you need theory first, um, which I think is interesting, and then put that theory into practice uh, as being the only way in which you can really be sure you, you know it. I completely agree. <laughs> so lecture five of, of, uh, of where? Yeah, sorry, that was um, uh, lecture five of an this stoic author of Masonius Rufus. If you want, so um, I think there are some um, Good. Uh, yeah, thank you, Giannis. Giannis, Giannis put a nice uh, website. So that's the link to the um, to this specific lecture. But the website in general basically has free versions of a bunch of Stoic and other Roman and Greek translations into English for free because they're all in the public domain. So if you want to read any any of them, you can you can go there. Um, I'm not sure some of the translations because then their public domain are like a, a ninety to hundred years old. So um, maybe 70 to 80, but so they may use some weird English, but they're definitely understandable. Thank you. Uh, I didn't know if you guys had anything else you wanted to discuss until we maybe take a five minute break and then come back to speaking about um, a curriculum. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's take, because um, I wanted to go into 8.15, maybe it's could we take a five minute break um, and then at, so 7.50, um, I'll turn my camera back on and we can resume. All right. Okay. See you guys soon. See you.
Hello. Hi, Nelly. <laughs> So, um, this next part, um, as I explained in the event details, I wanted to shift away because I didn't want this whole um, meetup to be for too long. And I also wanted a way to fit in both, both parts. So um, I wanted to transition now away from Epictetus and Musonius Rufus. And um, this is less about discussing theory or discussing the philosophy or discussing um, uh, how to apply um, certain of the philosophers ideas in the real world, but instead to um, because there haven't been many, there have been maybe three or four in the Berlin Stoics over the course of the last few months who maybe mentioned that doing something together or being a part of a curriculum or being a part of Stoic training um, would be interesting and that would they would be interested in participating in. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity to maybe take ideas down of what you guys would have in terms of a a Berlin Stoics curriculum, maybe not something like, um, and I got the idea from, I got a particular idea about how to maybe do something like that when I was, um, there's another Stoic group in Berlin. Um, it's a lot smaller. It's um, it's called the, uh, I think it's called the Guide to the Good Life um, or something like that, the Guide to the Stoic Good Life. Um, but if you look on meetup.com, you'll find this other stoic group. And I, I visited them. Um, we just, the three of us had a few beers um, at a local bar. And they said that they're following, um, <laughs> um, they're following Massimo Piliucci's uh, 52, um, Massimo Piliucci basically rewrote Epictetus' and Enchiridion, and he put it into a book of 52 stoic tips of how to live a good life. And it's meant for a full year. It's meant for 52 weeks. And every week you, you basically try and implement one of those 52 tips, but they have a buddy system. So what these two other guys do is they um, basically try and focus on uh, practicing one stoic exercise every week. And at the end of every week on a, on a Friday or Saturday, they give each other a call for like 15 minutes and just talk about how they're doing. Um, on that particular exercise, um, how it's affecting their lives. Are they seeing any results? Um, yeah, was it worth it? Um, are they even doing it correctly? Are they, um, uh, in what kind of cases are they applying it? And so forth. Um, that wouldn't be the end all be all of the curriculum, but I was just, that kind of got my head rolling. What if some of us um, on a voluntary basis started doing that? So um, we wouldn't start doing that now, but we would kind of think about a plan of how to really implement that. Um, what details will we follow the same book they use of 52 exercises um, and then open it up to the community on Telegram um, and maybe create some sort of Excel file and just keep record of um, um, who wants to pair up and who wants to um, go through this, go through a, our own made curriculum over the next however long you want to make it um, and we want to keep practicing it. Um, I actually wanted to share with you guys um, just three basic ideas. And again, I think these three ideas are just are, are just initial. And I think they're good in the sense that they're not necessarily something you have to stick by. They're like, they're at least maybe part of a more decentralized curriculum. Um, Screen. Oh, yeah, I can share a specific tab. Oh, perfect. I didn't know I could do this. I can share a specific tab open by my browser. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, I, so I made this web page introducing what a stoic curriculum could look like for us. Uh, and I, it, it first gives, I gave, I give three examples of what something, what three elements could be as part of our stoic curriculum and stoic training. Um, one of them is this peer to peer accountability. Um, however, for example, there's meditations cafes where I thought about once every month or once every two months, because I, I can't be there all the time. 
um, open up, uh, rent, rent a space, a small space for one night every, one evening every month and open it up to a joint meditations cafe where we all journal um, uh, um, and um, whether or not we wanna share, um, create a safe space where we can all meditate through journaling um, uh, in the stoic way. So using negative visualization, using um, ideal examples in life that we can follow, contemplating the sage, um, giving ourselves consolations, um, or uh, for example, um, uh, reflecting on discomforts that we've been practicing in journal form. Um, another, that, and the last example was practicing discomforts. So I tried to put a variety of them where you, you see peer-to-peer -peer accountability, something you could do together um, on a week-by-week -week basis, meditations, cafes, which are nothing structured. You can just go to whenever you want when they're open um, and practicing discomforts, which is something you, you can't really do together and it's something individual. Um, but these are just to start. And I have absolutely no idea of how to really implement this um, beyond a few examples like these but I was just wondering what you guys think and how you even think about participating in kind of a common, um, at least schematic of a, of a stoic training curriculum. I think it has um, a lot of value, Steve, because, you know, as much as we enjoy the academic side of stoicism without the practical elements and applying it to your life in certain situations um, it can be useless in some ways so I believe it has a, a, a tremendous amount of value uh, particularly the peer-to-peer -peer accountability element um, so if you have a buddy for example and at the weekend you say you know well what's happened this week um, well you know we discussed the dichotomy of control so we I really used that this week and it really helped me to get rid of 95% of my worries this week. And that's a, a potential discussion. I think the practical element of stoicism is absolutely vital that we participate in as a forum and as a community. It's a good point also you make that I put, um, so I do mention they're following these these specific 52 exercises that Massimo Piliucci recommends in his book. But we don't even have to do that. Like you said, like it could be, it could be week to week where every week the two partners decide on what to focus on that week um, and then come out on the other side discussing how it went. Um, for example, the dichotomy of control. Um, for Nelly, the dichotomy of control is a shorthand way that philosophers have 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 named the the, the stoic practice of understanding the difference between what you can control and what you can't control. So what's within your control, what's without your control, and obviously what's, what are, what are some things that you can influence but not completely control? Um, yeah, it's a really good, um, it's a really good example. Actually, the, the meetup I went to with these two guys who do this, uh, the whole the whole meetup they wanted to talk about the dichotomy of control um and the entire discussion went really well and actually i thought that this could this could be really useful in the in the real world um and i don't i also want to mention i think maybe accountability is too strong of a word i didn't want to i didn't know of any other word to use um they were talking about how um uh there were one or two weeks when one of them fell behind. Um, but the whole idea of having a partner to discuss this with every week kind of motivates them to get back on track. So one, one of them said they fell back one or two weeks worth of exercises. But after the first or second week, they said, oh, man, I'm going to go to this. I'm going to I'm going to call my friend and he's going to say um, he's going to talk about how it went for him. And I'm not going to have anything to say. So it kind of motivated him to kind of get back into the habit of, of practicing. Um, and that kind of, uh, that really hit at home what I wanted was not, not accountability in the sense that you'll be punished or that there's, you know, somebody's watching over you, but in the sense of kind of motivating each other to get, 
to get on track and practicing these exercises week to week. Um, yeah, it could, I, I think, I think maybe in the direction of, um, starting this, uh, peer to peer system, but never that that's the schematic. And then the curriculum would never impose, um, specifically the exercises that you do. Actually, I think that would be much more creative. Um, the, uh, for example, a cup, two peers could want more, um, gratitude in their life. Like Giannis was saying, like they could maybe want to focus on um, uh, feeling more gratitude and appreciation for the things around them, for their family, their friends, their luxuries. And so they focus on certain things they could do to enhance that. Whereas another two partners could discuss that they want to, um, they want to separate their judgments of things versus the things in themselves, right? The events that happen to them versus their impressions or opinions of those things. And so they focus more on a psychological element of stoicism and how to practice that. And so I think it would be interesting to have that variety in the curriculum too. Um, hmm. So I, I, I think collecting the exercises is a big challenge itself coming up with this i mean of course it's an easy solution to take this book that you mentioned because then there is something already there but from my perspective it would be very interesting to to have maybe uh, more uh, to elaborate on the exercises <laughs> more than uh, apply not 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 more but as much, it's equally interesting for me as, as applying them. Um, because I'm not sure if this book is, is the best option. This is what I'm trying to say. But, um, but that, it doesn't matter. I mean, the general idea is really good. Uh, I, but I don't understand yet. I haven't understood yet what, why you, the, the idea of two people applying it. At least I haven't understood. Um, the idea is that, um, and actually, since we're talking about this one exercise, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, the idea was that they would be on the same page. So um, every every week, when they when they call each other to see how their stoic training is doing, um, they wouldn't have to discuss two different things. Um, they could. It's, it's. I think it's a lot more motivating if they both discuss the same exercise that they've been trying to implement in their lives. They could share tips, techniques. Um, they could share circumstances. Um, they could make, they could, they, they could, maybe the idea would be to create like a, like a list of our own of hundreds of exercises. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but hundreds of exercises we can implement in real life. But then the partners, it's up for them to choose between them every week what they, what they would want to focus on each week. And it doesn't have to be weekly. I'm, I'm also thinking it could be every two weeks. It could be every month. Um, but the, the schematic of a, a two-partner system um, regularly um, calling each other or meeting up to discuss how the stoic training has been going on this similar exercise they're doing. You mean from this group or, 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 or two people from, from where? I, it could be anybody who signs up. I haven't thought about how to... How so it, it's, it's not necessarily connected to the meetup now or... No, no. Uh, I mean, it, I haven't understood that. that. That's exactly what I was. Well, it doesn't have to be in the sense that anybody can come into the meetup or anybody can come to the Berlin Stoics and say, hey, I want to join in this exercise week to week or month to month. But it's part of the group in the sense that I'm only going to be able to get people to register or to sign up for um, getting a partner to do this with by going through the meetup or going through the um the Berlin Stoics. If you're asking about this, the four of us here, no, I mean, it could, it's anybody from the Berlin Stoics. But again, we have no membership, we have no official registry. So it's, it's anybody who wants to, you know, join in, it doesn't have to be anybody who comes to these meetups. Um, yeah, but it will be uh, so, uh, so it's a curriculum for Maybe I miss I miss maybe I missed the beginning where you want to build this curriculum um, on this website. Uh, no, I mean, it's not, it's not building it on the website. That was just a web page for me to, to explain what my intentions are about the curriculum. 
the point of the curriculum is just to practice becoming a stoic in real life um, instead of, I, I really like these discussions, but um, I think um, there's an element missing from a stoic group and that is literally putting it into practice. I know we all do to some, to some extent, like some of us think about the ways in which we sometimes put some of these points into practice, but there's a kind of a community element where, um, you know, we come to these discussions and we say, hey, yeah, I thought about this the other day or I was doing this the other day, but um, there's uh, there's not really an active element of- This I agree with, but, but so, so, so how to make it, how, how you want to make it practical is by building these, for example, these uh, three pillars. One of it is some exercises, but how, how do people engage on this? It's by, by, by uh, coming to you and, and saying, hey, this is interesting, I want to participate. Or... or, or... Um, if you're asking how people get into it, um, I, I absolutely have no idea at this moment. I was thinking about, um, cause, um, that was, I have two questions about that actually. Um, one, uh, do I start advertising on, on the meetup page and in our telegram chat, if you want to sign up, um, and talk with a partner or use this form and, um, it would randomly appoint you with a, with a partner who you can share numbers with and you can start discussing how to um, um, mm -hmm. do this every week or every month mm -hmm. and call each other and discuss how they want to train in stoicism. Um, the, my other question was, um, uh, I don't want to make it seem like we all have to begin at the same time. I want this curriculum to be in such a way that anybody can join at any time. You know, if we start today, if, if Tony and I start um, meeting every week from from today, but then five months down the road, you and Nelly want to start doing this, then that should be possible without anybody telling you there's a specific start date. So that that's also the intention is that it's supposed to be where anybody can jump in and start any time they're still with training. So I don't want this to be a school. I just want this to be a guide. When I, when I say curriculum, I just mean stoic training and how to do that with another Mat material person. and ideas. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. it has to be in school and in the community. I think it's more just about applying some structure to the practical side of stoicism, um, a framework that. You Yeah, the idea of exercises is, is obvi the obvious one. I mean, it's it's the first one that comes to mind. And and <clears throat> I mean, like I said, maybe we can elaborate a little bit on the exercises through the meetup um, before before you before there is um, something more concrete on this page that you showed, like. Um, and all, of course, when people apply it, then they come back and say, "Yeah, we applied it. And we have better ideas about what, ex how to, uh, how to to make this exercise better or different or or additional uh, ideas for exercises." Yeah, but it can be a feedback loop, um, and through iterations, it can be uh, a nice a nice list of of ideas of for exercises. Um, and then, and then I guess you can collect this somewhere, right? Like, um, that's also the idea is to have like a, um, uh, Wix is kind of a terrible, um, it's, it's, it's okay, but there are some things you can't do on Wix. I, I wish we could, there is, um, there is a way in which I can create a table on, on one of Wix's web pages, And maybe I can, the idea is I want to get people who are who can sign into the web website to be able to um, um, change the table to be able to input in it to write comments in it so that it's like a living compendium right. Right. Of, right. of comments and techniques to be trained as stoic that's the idea is that it's living and it's ever growing um, yeah I have to create that but that's the idea 
That sounds good to me. Um, I mean, the the meditations cafes I was thinking about are something that, that you know, does, doesn't have to be um, necessarily decided amongst peers. I can just, I can see who's interested and open them up every month. Um, in terms of specific exercises, um, on a practical, from a practical level, um, it's entirely up to the partners whether they want to focus on something, again, psychological, like the dichotomy of control, or perhaps focus on something like a discomfort, like taking cold showers. Um, that it's entirely up. It's entirely up to them which element they would want to they would want to practice. Um, mm, I also there's another element which is I think the hardest one to put into this is that if we if we create this schematic if we create, if we create this framework we've discussed roughly speaking um, then I also feel like it should be somehow developmental like we should um, not that we reach an endpoint I think this the idea of this curriculum is that you can theoretically go on forever doing this but um, if you really want. Um, the idea is also that um, somehow all of us feel like we're um, um, like we're we're passing a point of there should be stages. There should be stages, or there should be some developmental element in the curriculum where you're you're visibly making progress um, in in practicing virtue and practicing stoicism. I am not sure how that's supposed to be implemented. Um, but that was my other, that's the hardest element in the curriculum that I haven't quite nailed down how to do because if every peer to peer um, partnership um, kind of goes in their own way, which exercises to do every week or every month, then it's kind of hard where every everybody in the Berlin Stoics is on the same page. Um, so I'm not sure if that's even possible, this kind of everybody, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be very difficult to objectively quantify and measure. Yeah. Uh, personally, I, I, I wouldn't even try. Um, but I, I think the, the personal achievement would be realized by the actual individuals themselves. Hmm. Maybe that can be shared through feedback or through forum. Hmm. Yeah, but I mean, there can be like um, uh, easier exercises and more difficult exercises. Or... or like our exercises on easier concepts and exercises on harder concepts. Could that be uh, uh, in terms of uh, levels? I would personally, sorry, Steve, I would just personally question whether that was, whether it was even required. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. I think that's, I think that's maybe actually to, to, to bounce off of both of you, I like the idea of levels, but because I'm unsure of if there are any, and if there are how to, how to attribute them to the exercises, maybe that's best for the feedback. So maybe in the, in the, in the, in the list of exercises we collectively create over time, there's like, we create a column about if you think, on a range of difficulty uh, of really mastering what is it for this specific exercise. And then over time to see if there's a, an average, an averaging on uh, uh, from everybody of this particular exercise, is this on average more difficult than others or not? Mm. But that's, I wouldn't put it in a, I put, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on different levels in the sense that people on level one can't, practice things on level two, just in the sense that things are more difficult than others. Maybe. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, sure. That, that's what I, that's how I meant it as well. Oh, okay. Um, um, <laughs> like <laughs> what uh, um, Rufus says uh, to, to, to keep the water in the mouth, but not spit it. And to spit it, don't drink it. <laughs> it's it's, it's the, the last step. <laughs> The last step. Uh, just um, for Nelly too, I think this would be very useful, Nelly, to learn more about the practical side of stoicism. Um, yes, yeah, sure. certainly 
you know, these practical exercises are the things that really help you on a day to day basis. If you're experiencing any form of difficulty, um, if, you, if it's difficult to find answers in some way to, to issues that we experience, these type of exercises can genuinely help. Um, so the practical side of things is extremely important and I would really encourage you to, to get involved. Thank you. But I, I think uh, the peer to peer, uh, it would be, it would be, uh, it would be uh, unfair to, to, to my peer, I think, <laughs> to have me as a peer. So uh, I think the peer to peer would not work very well with, uh, with, uh, with beginners. It, it would really be open for everybody. I mean, you don't have to have read a lot about stoicism to, I, I, I also thought there was a th there could be a theoretical element of the curriculum, but on the practical side, like what we're discussing now, anybody like just just for example, take um, I'll actually read a little bit of Epictetus, just the first paragraph, like so this dichotomy of control um, where he says um, of existing things, some are of existing things, some are not in our power, others are uh, of, and and others are in our power. In our power are conception, effort, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever are our actions. But what's not in our power are our, bro our body, our property, reputation, rulers, and in a word, whatever are not in our actions. So for example, you don't have to have read anything else in Stoicism. I mean, maybe you want to read a little bit more about this dichotomy of control, understanding in real life, um, if you're struggling with something, what's within your power to control with what you're not what, and what's not. Um, and you, you can be a beginner and still do this. It's not, it's not required of you. Um, and your partner and you could decide on whichever exercise together that you do. And it could be something um, that they know is easy enough to, to read up about in Stoicism that you think could help you. And this is a very, like, also, Stoicism has a huge psychological element in it. They were psychologists. They have a few psychological tips as well that are not simply hardships or, or toils as well, um, if that put you off. But I mean, a beginner can absolutely do this. That's the whole point. Um, but I was thinking that there would be, if if there is some concern, and now, and now I'm just, I'm not just thinking of you, Nelly, I'm also thinking of everybody else um, who, who may be interested in joining a, such a curriculum, um, any beginner who might feel like they don't know enough about stoicism to do it. Because I know like me saying it's okay for beginners to join, sometimes isn't enough reassurance for some people. And I, I thought about also um, uh, opening up an optional, um, maybe book series, um, month by month, where month by one month, um, uh, we follow the classics and then we or, you, or we follow some modern books on stoicism like one of Massimo Piliucci's books or one of Donald Robertson's books or or so forth or one of William Irvine's books uh, one of these introductory modern um, books on stoicism and um, month by month um, beginners have a chance to also read something introductory and become more confident in the theory um, that's not so difficult as maybe reading the classics, um, but optional, something that um, obviously wouldn't be imposed. And I don't think something that has to be peer to peer, something that we could do something like this at where we focus um, like a separate series of online discussions or in-person discussions on these particular books. Yeah, I, I'll be interested in the book to be honest. Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, and as a, as it's just me, my personal preference probably at this stage is to observe rather than participate. Uh, so like today, I learned a lot. I feel like I I benefited a lot from all of you. Um, so I think that's how beginners will feel in in your curriculum. It's like we probably wouldn't be able to contribute, but. But because of the members in the group, we um, uh, we, we we if I if I had started this alone, it would be a lot more difficult than your curriculum, for sure. And we appreciate you too, Nelly. 
because you bring some interesting viewpoints today. So thank you. So, That's nice to say. Thank you. I know I didn't bring any, but thank you. No, you did. <laughs> you did really, and it's um, yeah, you did. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Well, thanks. It's also it's also helpful for us. I mean, the more the more we explain, the more we feel more confident in what we know about stoicism. Like when I when I was discussing what um, the whole reason for the Stoics talking about hardships and discomforts, and then Giannis brings up this entirely other dimension why they do them. And that's I wasn't thinking of it at the very moment, and so it's helpful for us to also think about these things. Um, but yeah, that's good to know that maybe beginners would like more of a introductory book series, um, uh, something low key that they could get used to the ideas of stoicism before they, I won't begin that until August because we have three or four meetups before already over the next week and a half before I go on vacation for two weeks. So in August is when I'll probably start that book series. And I wanted to start it at that month because well, I wanted the next month for people to start reading the book. So, um, but um, actually there's another question. Um, I, 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 I bought like five or six new um, introduction to Stoicism books um, and I've been reading across them over the last couple of weeks. And I was wondering if, especially, especially cause I know Giannis and, and Tony, you've read some introductory books on this. If there's a preference what you would, what would you recommend to a beginner, somebody who's never read anything about Stoicism, who doesn't want to read the classics? What's like an introductory book you would say, read this, perfect to introduce yourself to Stoicism? Personally, I, I like um, Donald Robertson's style of writing. Um, so he has, obviously, there's a number of introductory books by him. Um, one on the meditations, which is very interesting. Um, but I think his writing style is 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 very sort of um, all inclusive. It's not too academic, and it's also very practical as well. So I would encourage um, you to consider Donald Roberts above all the others. Really, I mean, you have Ryan Holiday as well, um, sort of on the modern Stoic side. I'm not a big fan, <laughs> to be honest. I, I guess I agree with Tony. I think I think he's 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 good, uh, but personally, and, and so that I'm not the right person to ask this question because personally, the best introductory book I have read, and I go back to it uh, to understand Stoicism, is uh, it's not it's, it's this one from uh, yeah you know uh, from. Um, Hado, I don't know how to pronounce with his friend. So, um, the inner, the inner cedar, citadel. Because he, 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 but he's a little bit more academic, but not too much. Uh, and I think he does excellent job in analyzing the values and the principles of um, uh, Stoicism. Uh, but he's more focused on Marcus Aurelius, so he's analyzing the. Um, the meditations, um, but for my side, I haven't found a better and more insightful analysis of the um, of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and so that that's that that was my introduction to to Stoicism from my side. Um, I have read a few of these more popular books. Um, but to me, I don't know, they're, they're uh, sometimes a bit simplistic. Or not to say it differently, they don't connect, uh, the, I, um, they don't connect to the original text directly. And, and I'm missing that. I like to read, to read also the original um, uh, text to understand how it was phrased and then see the interpretation or something but but these these um, books that you mentioned are more <clears throat> forget what has been said uh, i will tell you the story from the beginning uh in my way and and this doesn't work 
uh, for me so well. Okay, that's just that's why I'm not the right. Maybe I'm not the right person to to say which of these books are better. I have read some of of the um, some of them. Um, uh, I think Tony. I think what Tony said. I would. I would uh, uh, put a plus one. Um. Actually, I should read. Um, I should read Donald Robertson. I haven't. I read the the other the the introductory uh, books on Stoicism. Like the more popular books, I've only I've only recently read are um, uh, William Irvine. Um, uh, who actually I think does a better job. So I've also been reading Massimo Piliucci, um, How to Be a Stoic. Um, it's okay. Massimo Piliucci's book is a bit too simplistic. So in that regard, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I would recommend him if somebody prefers that, but I actually prefer William B. Irvine. He does a bit better of a job um, uh, there are different elements in Piliucci's work, but Irvine to me is a bit more classic and interesting to read. But he doesn't he doesn't quote the Stoics as much as Piliucci does, but it's less simplistic. I can't explain it. He also adds to it, like he adds to the Stoicism. Like it was it was William Irvine who popularized the idea of the trichotomy of control. So he in his chapter he he expanded on how there isn't just two dimensions things that are within your power and not in your power. And then he, he, he understood it as, no, there are things you can influence partly, but not fully control. So he does add some flavor to Stoicism as well. Actually, one book I would recommend, um, which is not too simplistic, and at this, it's, it's more academic, at the same time that it's, um, uh, um, it's also a really good introduction it's dense, but not academic in the sense that you have to have known about Stoicism beforehand. Um, it's called, um, I'm in the middle of reading it right now, A, a New Stoicism by Lawrence Becker, um, which you guys have probably heard of. It's, um, uh, he wrote this, this is the revised edition from 2017, and he revised it about 20 years after he initially wrote it. And, um, his idea was not just to summarize Stoicism, but would also also to reinterpret it in a modern context. Um, and he does a really, really good job. It's it's dense though. What I like about it is that like Massimo Piliucci and William Irvine and, and Donald Robertson, they focus a lot on the psychological and the ethical dimensions of Stoicism. Lawrence Becker has fat chapters on the theology and on the logic of Stoicism in addition to the ethics. So I think if you want a more whole approach of the philosophy, um, maybe one of those introductory books aren't aren't the best. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's where you want the emphasis. Um, uh, I'm not too sure how to start the book series, but I'll think it over um, and I'll use you guys' um, suggestions. Um, I also put some suggestions online. I think we'll, cre we'll create like a, like a list, just like um, we were doing with the exercises of recommended books and um, uh, to read. Um, I have that actually Excel file you'll find on the resources page on our website of a bunch of articles and some books you can read on Stoicism. But um, I think a shorter list of modern books in Stoicism is called for, for people, anybody wanting to introduce themselves. And then just to just to just to maybe stop uh, my um, my spiel with this one book I I just ordered but I haven't got into yet um, but I'm really really interested in doing it's called um, the practicing stoic have you heard of it Giannis? Um it's a it's it's really interesting what he what what he does is um, mm. he reviews stoicism. But all he does is quote the original Stoics. But the way he does it is that, let's say he, like he has a chapter on judgment. The, and what he does is he takes all these quotes, all these passages from Epictetus, from yeah. Schopenhauer, from Cicero, from Seneca, that all have to do with judgment and then puts it into context with each other. So it's really, really, um, I'm really interested in getting into this because that, that's, 
that would be really interesting to see like passages of Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus that are separately about the same thing come together. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have it. I have it in my at least to to buy this book, and it's exactly the style that I was trying to say. It's it's more preferable to me this style. Hmm. Um, so I think I think I should uh, good that you mention it. I, you reminded me that I wanted to buy this book as well. And it, it's good that he's quoting people like Cicero, you know, authors outside of the big three, Stoics. I think that's important as well, just to provide some wider context. Um, because I know for a fact that Robertson tends to concentrate a lot on, you know, Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius. But we do have all these other characters involved in the story. And whether they help to form Stoicism in some way or influence it, I think that's just as important. He also quotes more modern philosophers. He quotes Montaigne, Schopenhauer. He, he uh, just flipping on a random page, he quotes Plutarch, another ancient philosopher, but and 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 a uh, 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 writer, but not a Stoic. So he he quotes from these other non completely non-stoic even non-stoic affiliated characters and it's really interesting to see like oh he even quotes adam smith and so yeah he he takes like these um maybe stoic influences on future writers and what they have to say about the same principle in stoicism was adam smith an anti-stoic i actually don't know i only know him for his economics for his um uh he was a I think he was a, a, a vocal anti stoic. I may be wrong. Um, that's it. That's all I had for you guys. I mean, those were the only basic ideas I had for a curriculum, and I think the ideas would maybe snowball over time. Um, I will probably introduce the book series first, at least formally, because I need people to get have some time to, well, start reading the book. So I'll probably introduce that first this week, but this week I should hopefully find a way to have people to um, sign their name up and partner with somebody else um, to start this curriculum. And as well, participate in creating this list of exercises, which I'll start, I'll start us off with, but then open it up on Telegram to see who wants to, who wants to add to it, so. But it's 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 uh, hard how to structure this because you I mean then you have to structure the questions in some way and how how let's see how you would do it I mean is this um, according to virtues or according to what like ah okay um, I, I, just, I mean you cannot just list them uh, uh, like a bunch of them but you have to structure it somehow. Um, um, no, you're, you're right. Um, I mean, I was thinking of, I understood by columns, we could give them attributes or values, like which mm -hmm. virtue are you practicing here or which discipline are you practicing here? Mm -hmm. But, um, I think maybe you're right. Maybe more generally it should be structured for specific disciplines or specific virtues. Mm -hmm. Um, I think maybe the discipline the discipline route is better or virtue route. I think we have to keep it consistent. We could also give them values. Like we can also kind of write a comment next to every um, one about which virtues it, they're emphasizing in your practice. But um, maybe I create two. <laughs> so I have to think about this. Um, it's it's hard, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, personally, I just think simplicity is key. What is you said? S simplicity. What simplest? I didn't, I didn't hear the first part. Yeah, I just think simplicity is the key. Oh, okay, okay. Keep it, keep it simple. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah no, I'm not going to create. I'm not going to create. Yeah, I mean, you can divide it by pi if you want, but you know, I mean, you lose people yeah. along the way. Does this? Does this thing not work properly? Or? It has on and off, uh, like up and down. Uh, oh, okay. 
Yeah, that's why sometimes your volume goes uh, goes away and sometimes it comes back. So that's all. Uh, so um, okay. I have to go, but um, yeah. it's been a pleasure, everybody. And um, thank you for joining us for, for the discussion about the Epictetus. Thank you guys for really staying about curriculum because I wanted to open up to everybody but have some feedback first from people. And Nelly, Thank you very much for joining with us and being so patient. You've you've asked great questions. You've you thank you for your input. Thank you all for sharing with me. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good night. Now. Good night. Au revoir. Thank you all. Bye bye. Au revoir. Good evening, guys. See you later, guys. Have a great week. You too. Bye.